everybody. Welcome back to A Late Show. I'm really excited to check in with John Baptiste tonight. John, hello. Hey, what's happening, Steven? What's happening is you've got to let me know when there are big events going on with John Baptiste. I had to find out about this online. Look, what, look what's oh. coming out on December 17th, next Thursday. It's available for pre-order now. It is the Disney Pixar soundtrack, Soul, Jazz Compositions and Arrangements by John Baptiste. That's extraordinary. It's one yes. of two albums that are yes. uh, coming out uh, with that movie. What what can we expect on this, John? What's going on? Oh, my goodness. There's so much music in the film. Trent Reznor and Atticus, as well as myself, jam-packed the film with music, and it's amazing. I'm so glad it's coming out because it's going to uplift people when they see it, you know? And this is music from and inspired by the film, and and I understand you did the compositions and the arrangements of all the all the songs on this album. Yes. Yes, I, I, I had a band. Uh, the oldest person in the band is Roy Haynes, who was a guest on our show. He was 95 and we recorded this record. Was he the, the one playing the, 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 the D bass, or was that? He was, he was playing the drums. It was, uh, it, he played the drums with Joe, and uh, he was there. He was 92 at the time. <laughs> he was on our show. You were also a cultural uh, consultant on the film. What, yeah. what, what did that job entail? Just uh, talking about the the way that musicians live in the world and the way that we play together so that it can feel very authentic when you watch it and not seem like, you know, if you see music in film sometimes, it doesn't feel real. Um, so I wanted to give them the real vibes, you know? John Baptiste, everybody. The album is sold. Go get it. Thanks, John. Yes. My first guest tonight is an author and Emmy-winning journalist who hosts The Rachel Maddow Show, her latest book is called Bagman. Please welcome to A Late Show, Rachel Maddow. Rachel, good to see you again. Stephen, it is great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's, it's, it's always a, a bit of a vacation for me to have you on the show because you're such a champion talker that I can sit back and just watch you take apart the stories of the day. It's really, it's really delightful. Um, uh, before we get started, I want to I wanna talk to you. A, a few weeks ago, you give a powerful broadcast from your home about how your partner, Susan, had contracted COVID. Um, first of all, how is she doing? Is she all right? She is okay. She's got, um, she, she had a, you know, a real case of it. And like a lot of people who had, you know, symptomatic cases, she's got kind of the long tail of the symptoms, mm -hmm. which is almost true for almost everybody that I know that's had it. She's got, you know, the fatigue and the headaches and the cough and stuff kind of lingering. But she is out of the woods in terms of us being you know, scared that she could take her downturn. And so she's, she's going to be fine. It's, it's been a bear to, to deal with it. it. It was the scariest thing I've ever been through in my life, but she's going to be okay. And how has that changed your coverage of COVID now that it's, it's been in your own home and with, with, uh, with your, your, your dearest one? It's an interesting question. I mean, I think, I mean, if I'm honest about it, this probably sounds a little bit academic, but the reaction to me talking about that on the air, to me saying, listen, I take this as seriously as anybody, but I just realized that I wasn't that scared about getting it myself. But seeing Susan suffering with it is the scariest thing in my life, and I would now do anything to prevent that sort of risk to her. Me putting it out there, the way people responded to that made me sort of realize that I think we need to pay closer attention to what motivates people and their behavior around risk. It's, you know, it's one thing to just say, don't do it. That's, that's dangerous. Don't do it. That's, you know, potentially going to get you into trouble. You know, no, 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 no. It's another thing to understand that people take risks for a reason. It's human nature. It doesn't make you a bad person. Um, but for me, I, it was just sort of revelatory to realize that I care a lot more about my partner uh, and her safety than I do about myself. And I don't know what that says about me psychologically, but I realized that was the motivational trip for me. And it made me realize we, got, we had to sort of think about what moves people more than we already have been, especially now that we're going to have this vaccine. We're going to have to think about what's going to motivate people to sort of do the right thing around the vaccination program. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the administration of our, our public health and, and eventually the administration of the rollout of this vaccine. Um, you interview uh, top health experts and immunologists and, and epidemiologists. Uh, have you already seen any change in um, the leadership 
of uh, the medical community now that they know that there's going to be an administration coming in that takes this a little more seriously? Yeah, I, I have. And, I mean, you even see it at the CDC. The CDC is the, the international gold standard disease prevention agency in the world. And they just got absolutely battered under Trump. In, in, and it resulted in them doing a lot of dumb stuff. Um, and since the election, even with Trump still there, you've seen them start to assert themselves and sort of speak more plainly. You've started to see CDC officials make public facing statements and do briefings for reporters in a way that that had all been subsumed, subsumed under the White House and their like quack patrol that they had there. But now we're getting this very clear guidance from the CDC. You should wear a mask every time you are anywhere other than home, any out, any indoor uh, setting that you're in other than your own house, you should wear a mask. Yes, that's true. You could have said that months ago, but at least you're saying it now. So we're seeing it from the CDC, but also there's all these very serious experts that are coming in and advising Biden. They're doing lots of public facing discussions, lots of interviews, speaking with one voice, all very consistent. And that just feels like a sea change from the, you know, the clown show stuff that, that Trump was doing at the White House. It feels better already. Now that we know, I mean, 2020 has been a singular year. There's been there's been no year like this in my life, at least not in my adult sort of conscious life. I know there were some terrible things, terrible years in the 1960s when I was a child, but there's been nothing like this year, but there's been nothing like the last four years either. And as someone who um, consumes an enormous amount of news in order to curate it and distill it for your audience to try to give it some, as I've said, you're the master of parts on a lawn and saying, these are the parts of a story, let me put it together and show you how the engine works. You actually have to consume a lot of that poison every day of what the administration is, or this present administration is trying to sell to the American people and to the world. How do you think that has affected the way you approach reporting the news? Ah. Because that's going to hopefully go back to a different sort of source of news nutrient after this. But what, what, now that it's coming to an end, to some degree, do you have any perspective on what it's done? Are you asking basically, did this break me? <laughs> no, <laughs> I... but it did, it did it in some way change your chemical composition? It might have changed what I am able to digest and how. I mean, I, I feel like this was, I mean, this is a great time to be in the news business because we've never been more vital um, just to learn these basic rules again, that if we didn't know them before, you know, don't listen to what they're saying, just watch what they're doing. You know, don't, um, don't, uh, don't take at face value something that you get from a government official just because a government official is saying it. Those rules became very easy to remember all of a sudden again in the Trump administration, mm -hmm. which was good, but they're good rules for us for all time. I, I just feel like, to a certain extent, like training to do this work means you like learn the rules of the road and you learn how to operate safely and you like build up your skills. You, you know, you take lessons, you learn from the best. You do, it's like, like getting a commercial driver's license. Like I'm going to be a big rig driver. I'm going to be out on America's highways. I'm going to convey myself down that highway in a way that is safe for my fellow travelers. And then you enter into this administration and instead of getting your big rig and getting on the highway, it turns out it's bumper cars. And all the cars, what you're gonna do all day is smash into each other and try to hurt each other. And that's your driving, that's your job now. And, and the guy I, in the biggest bumper car is saying, everyone else is not obeying the rules. And the rules are wherever I drive is fine. And I'm also, I've put dynamite charges in my bumper. So when I hit you, you might die, right? So it's, it's been, it's been it's been weird, and it I think has unwired a lot of us in the business in a way. But I'm really looking forward to Biden being boring. I mean, he sort of promised to be boring. So and am if he I. Is, I'm just I've never been more excited by vanilla in my entire life. <laughs> Two scoops, please. Yes. Are, are, are there any particular members of the cabinet that he's announced that excite you most with their um, base competency? Well, I mean, all of their boring base competency is itself like thrilling to an almost like adult movie level degree at this sure. point. <laughs> like, sure. Look at you with all your degrees and experience mm. and cool headed appro approach to mainstream problems. Tear me off Come a piece of that here. CV. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, 
I am I am undone by your MD MPH CDC director. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Says here you've done some pro bono work. <laughs> I've read all your amicus briefs. Yeah, so it's it's um I, I get thrilled by new things, which uh, yeah, pe people knowing what they're doing is back. The SCOTUS rejected a bid to overturn the Pennsylvania results yesterday. And we also passed something called Safe Harbor Day, when essentially the electors are locked. Do you think that for all intents and purposes, there are no more balls to be thrown, and after this, everything is just chatter? It's, yeah. Hmm. I mean, on Earth One, this mm -hmm. is over. Sure, on Prime. But, <laughs> but on, in Trump land, this is still a very remunerative thing. Like, he's still making tons of money from doing this and making some sort of political hay that we're not sure what he's going to what he's going to do with in the in the future. I mean, Safe Harbor Day is the day by which basically any state that certifies who it's sending to the Electoral College, Congress, like, can't mess with them. They have to accept those electors. All 50 states, as of today, have now certified their election results. Like, there's no, there's no history in this country of any court for any reason overturning a properly certified election result in any state, let alone the whole bunch of states that you'd need to have overthrown in order for Trump to do this election. But yet... You know, they're trying to get another lawsuit up to the Supreme Court. 17 attorneys general from 17 red states signed on to this new effort by the Texas attorney general, who himself is under indictment uh, to get this stuff done. I, I mean, they'll, I think they'll do this stuff for as long as they can continue to get people to send them money to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and for Trump, that might be infinite. I mean, he might still be raising money for his phantom legal challenges in 2026. But in terms of actually overturning the election, there's there's just zero, zero possibility. It's done. Rachel, we have to take a quick break, but um, stick around, everybody. When we come back, I will ask Rachel what loose ends and mysteries about the Trump administration she hopes we find out once he's out of office.